game against United at home was a big, big turning point. We were still seven, eight points ahead. At half time, you know, we absolutely battered them in the first half. Smeichel was making saves, Lezzo hit the post. They're clearing it off the line. Maybe then we spoke about and saying, look, whatever we do, we don't lose this game. Kevin said, go and show them that we're a better team. It was never about us winning it or the group of players. It was about the fans. You know, when I see Blackburn winning the Premier League, Leicester, you know, Liverpool after third, we should have been there. Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today, Warren Barton is joining me for a chat and Newcastle fans will appreciate the six and a half glorious years that Warren spent on Tyneside being an unforgettable part of the entertainers and then continuing his spell throughout more memorable eras of the club under Kenny Dalglish and Sir Bobby Robson. I just can't wait to talk to him about his two years. I started supporting the club in the entertainers era, so I guess I'm just excited to get some first-hand insight. Remember to subscribe for more Newcastle content and let's get into it. Hey everyone, welcome to 10 Questions with Warren Barton. Warren, I really appreciate you joining us. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. Fantastic to have you on. I'm going to jump straight into question one. Now, this is pretty much early days. So you started your league career actually at Maidstone United and you were actually gaining quite a lot of attention early on. And at the time, you actually had a day job. Is that right? You were working in an accounting firm. So whilst you were juggling that, I mean, did you have the big dreams to just make it professional and do it full time? Yeah, if I go back a couple of more years as well, being told at 16, you're actually too small. You're never going to make it. A team called Leighton Orient, which is on the uh, east side of London, where I was uh, living at the time. Um, that's all I knew. You know, I had to make ends meet. It's like anything, you know, I had to get a job uh, living with my mum, brother and sister. Um, so uh, a friend of mine was working as a chartered accountant. It seems quite glamorous and I'm going to keep stick with it. But I was actually working in the mail room. <laughs> so I was just collecting the documents and the mail and taking it up to the, uh, the accountants and their secretaries. But it was a way of of still keeping that opportunity because Mason at the time and where I was at Dagenham and Redbridge was non-league football amateur. Uh, so we was getting paid at that time £25 a week. And if we won, we got a £5 bonus. Um, so obviously we had to go out and, and get a job. And um, I kept going for a chartered accountant called Arthur Anderson. And it was a great company and a big company. So they looked after you. But I used to go into the city on my moped, Honda 50cc. Freezing cold across these area called Hackney Marshes, where it'd be raining and cold, which is, which is where England is uh, and London, and then go back to go uh, non-league training and perform. But it's all I knew, you know. I, I was never going to do that job for the rest of my life. Um, as I said, as a young boy at 13, 16, you're told you're too small, you're never going to make it. Uh, but I was driven to to go forward and, and just hard work commitment. But as I said before, it's all I really knew. And that's all I ever wanted to do. Even when I was sitting in the office and collecting the documents in a nice warm office and taking them around, I was looking out the window thinking one day I want to play for a big club and play for my you know, country and play in the FA Cup final. So it was wow. always my dream and always my ambition. I guess every young boy growing up here and even girls, you know, they have those dreams, but it seems that you really set your mind to it. And it wasn't actually that long until you, it really did take off. You were at Wimbledon, so that was June 1990. You were quite a young lad, you know, you'd come from lower leagues into, you know, quite some big characters were there. The notorious, like, crazy gang. And you being a younger boy coming from lower leagues, how did that feel, joining that dynamic and knowing the reputation? Well, you either sunk or swim. And I think because of my background, again, being rejected, having to work hard. Go, I mean, when I played non-league, you walked into a change room. As I said, if we won, we got five pounds. And if you let a go in and in the change room, you've got a policeman, you've got a plumber, you've got a builder, you've got, uh, you know, electricians that are there, roofers, tilers. And if you lost the game, they would let you know. Uh, and then probably in, a, in an ideal world, going to the crazy game was very much like that, that togetherness, living together, working together. We socialise. Even now, you know, 20 odd years afterwards, it's still... On WhatsApp, there's about 17, 18 of us that keep in contact. And if I was there at Christmas, we'd, and if we were allowed to with a pandemic, we'd go and have a drink uh, and reminisce. And it was, as I said, sink or swim. You know, when I first got to the club for Maystone, within about three or four months, I was actually in the England setup. 
And at that time, you got a fax that come through the fax machine and the manager would come down and said, look, congratulations, Warren Barton's been selected in the uh, in the England setup with Graham Taylor or Terry Venables, whoever it was at the time. And the lads would probably then beat me up, strip me, throw me in a cold puddle. <laughs> I'd get back to my car and all my tyres were slashed on my car. It wasn't a great car, it was a, you know, a Golf, but... And not until a couple of days afterwards, it wasn't actually Vinnie Jones or John Fashnew or Dean Holdsworth. It was actually the owner of the club, Sam Amman. He slashed my tyres. And it was a way of keeping your feet on the ground and sticking together. I could never, at the time, I couldn't pay for four tyres to be repaired. But it was the way of Wimbledon and coming from that non-league setup to say, OK, you're in the top league. We're in, we've just won the FA Cup. Uh, we're finishing seventh, eighth in the Football League, Premier League but you're still part of the hard work commitment and it's about that togetherness. Wow. And we would we would win a lot of games, which is maybe not a good thing, in the tunnel. You know, we would play against a Southampton, a Norwich, a Coventry, and one of their players would say something, oh, this is not the crazy gang. And John Fashion would walk out with his top off, he's all odd up, he's got muscle on muscle. And, you know, we'd say, come on then, let's go now. And there'd be a bit of, you know, argy-bargy in the, in, the, in, the, in the tunnel where Sky wasn't around at the time. And it would all kick off and, you know, they'd be petrified and we'd win the game. And we could count on them games to, to keep us in the Premier League and, and obviously be mid-table. But there were some good players as well. But it was a, I think you can tell by the way I'm speaking, it was a great time for me to go from a non-league player to going in with a big time and being in with the big boys. And from a young boy turning me into a, a, a man to compete at that level for, you know, 15 years, I was lucky enough to play in the top flight for. Wow, what a great first opportunity to just get you in the pecking order and get involved in that that level of football around those kind of characters. So then it was five years later when you actually got the call for the move to obviously Newcastle United. And at the time, you're actually very much in demand. You know, you were one of the highly rated defenders in the whole of the country. And your fee, I guess, was four million pounds, which was actually the British transfer record. With all of those options, what was it that swayed you towards the Northeast? Well, I think um, I'd spoken to David Dean at Arsenal, but they was unsure about the manager. Arsene Wenger didn't come until October. So me and Les Ferdinand being in England set up and being in London at QPR and Wimbledon, we would see each other sometimes and like, where are you going? And we seemed to be linked at the same clubs. I was actually was in a car on my way up to Blackburn with Kenny Dalgleish, but then that all got turned back. Sheffield Wednesday, Celtic, uh, Man City as well at the time. But I think once you come across Kevin Keegan, they'd finished six the season before, uh, the style of football that they played. They come and watch me a game in uh, against Sheffield Wednesday, actually, where there was a few people there. And that's when Kevin said he made my mind up. I've, I've been playing, as you said, very consistent, you know, obviously doing quite well. Um, and he was willing to pay that money. Uh, but going back a little bit, in about, it was about March time, uh, February time, I played against Newcastle for Wimbledon. And afterwards, me and uh, my good friend at the time, Robbie Earl, was doing a cool down. And I was just talking to Robbie and I said, imagine playing for this lot. You know, the stadium was unbelievable, the fans and the atmosphere. It was a cold, as I said, February, March, early March game um, and the atmosphere. And then we went back to the hotel and Arthur Cox was there, who, again, there was no... So we're just talking about football and what the club was like and what they was achieving. I've been around the England setup and spoken to you know Rob Lee, Peter Beardsley, Barry Venison as well was great. We're just talking about the game and what Newcastle w was going and where they was going under Kevin Keegan. Uh, so that was a big my, in my back of my mind. And then when I met Kevin on a bank holiday Monday, again I never forget it, is that uh, Blackburn had played Newcastle and Alan Shearer had scored for Blackburn at the far post. Uh, a game that was quite high profile at that time. They won the game 1-0. Well, beforehand, Kevin had come down to London and met me in a hotel with Terry McDermott. And he just tapped me on the shoulder and said, come and join a big club. And when he when he says that type of thing, and, and you know, I've been around and, you know, it was either, if I'm being totally honest, it was them or Arsenal. Um, that I was, you know, I was an Arsenal fan. I was born in North London. That was my team. But just being around, you know, Peter Beardsley, Rob Lee in particular, uh, Kevin, and just being in that St. James's Park at that time, with, at that time it was only 36,000 people, we could have, but it could have been 66,000 people, the noise, the atmosphere. And that was like a Tuesday night against Wimbledon. So imagine on a, a Sunday against Man United or Arsenal or Chelsea or, or, or one of the big boys. Um, so when he said that, the fee was already agreed. 
it was never going to be an issue wages because it in my life it was never about the money i think if you do well that's going to come along it was leaving wimbledon to go and challenge and try and win things and try and establish my english career england career as well so that's the the main reason i'd served my purpose at wimbledon and then as i said when there was people like kevin keegan banging at the door and what newcastle their style of football and just the city the vibe it was it was exciting it was fun there was lots of development um it was a no-brainer in the end and uh, i'd never re- you know you never regret it going there it was fantastic and like you said you you obviously knew the reputation and everything that comes with playing at newcastle but was there a specific defining moment when you signed that made you realize the intensity that comes with playing in the black and white stripes the media day when i was there it was a big you said the british record i'd obviously been involved in the england setup and made my debut uh, for england earlier that year so there was a bit of hype I remember going to the stadium and there was people outside which I couldn't believe that people had come along. I mean there's only not only but 3 4 500 people that had come along to wow. see what was happening because it was you know me then there was Les and then there was Janola and then there was Shaka. So there was a lot of excitement in the area. But I remember our first day of training as I said the four of us was in a hotel in Newcastle just north called Gosford and we'd get in the the car I was a chauffeur so Kevin would say to me let's pick the boys up. <laughs> bring them in so I would drive everybody in and we turned up to training at a place called Maiden Castle which is in Durham just a little bit south of Newcastle and there was about 5,000 people there all in black and white there was cars parked, parked on hedges there was cars, cars parked against a tree and it took us Whoa. about 25 30 minutes so that's when you sort of understand it's it is a big club you, you're playing for people you're playing for a city you you're not just representing yourself and the badge it's, it's more than that and people like Lee Clark, Steve Watson, Robbie Elliott, all the local lads and particularly Peter, you know, he made you realize that you're not just playing for a club you or Kevin Keegan or David Ginola, you're playing for a bit more than that. People are working hard Monday to Friday and they want to be entertained. Um and I love that. I thrive on that. Even talking about it now the hairs of my arms stand up because some people get suffocated with that. But I go back to my upbringing about wow, someone actually wants to come and watch me train. They want to go. There was like 10,000 people on the waiting list for a season ticket. When we used to, you know, do the shirts at the Adidas store for uh, Newcastle, the granddad collars, at midnight, there'd be like 5,000 people outside waiting for a shirt. So it was in that mindset, in that area, you, you go into Newcastle. The first thing you see is St. James's Park. You don't see a building or, you know, an old, you know, the city hall. You see the football ground. And that emulates what the city is and what they are. And that's when you realise people don't understand it. And again, some people it suffocates, but, you know, we loved it. You know, Les, myself, David, you know, we'd go down to Coventry or Southampton. There'd be like 5,000 Geordies there. You know, they're selling the place out. The first time it ever happened at at Blackburn, Ewood Park, 10,000 people behind the goal. Man United didn't do that. Um, Other clubs, Arsenal didn't do that. The Geordies would do that. And we, we used to go out early. You know, Kevin would say, look, you know, 20 minutes, uh, 20 past two, go out and have your warm-up. We wanted to get out beforehand and see all the Geordies and it would get you you motivated. So, um, yeah, you, that's when you understand and realise. And as, as I said, I, I, I loved every minute of it. It was it was a great time. My family, you know, everything else was, was great. Sometimes, as I said, you go into a restaurant and people want to know what's going on and what's happening and you'd be there for an hour talking to them. But... It, it, it was worth it. It was it was brilliant. And 1995, really big, exciting things were happening at the time. And you mentioned the sort of the expectations you had from Kevin Keegan, you know, when he first tapped you on the shoulder and you realised that you're part of his plans. Did your um, impression of him change at any point when you met him and when you started working with him? Yeah, no, you knew with Kevin, I mean, he wears his heart on his sleeve and there's obviously been lots of times. So when you met him the first time and I'm, you know, I've been around him long enough to realise what people are like. He was an open book and he was great. As I said, I love Kevin. When it was going well, he was the best. He was the Messiah. When it wasn't, then he didn't he didn't like it you know he had to work things out and it, there's other things now i'm 50 odd years of age i can see sometimes with kevin that he was so open that you know things sir alex ferguson would get to him or there'd be a problem with something he would understand like when the the, the club changed to being on the stock exchange he didn't emulate with that he couldn't work it out it was about he was just about football and pleasing the fans and pleasing his players um so when you meet kevin it's just how he is and he's the same now as he was 25 years ago he's still passionate about the club 
loves the club, loves football. So Kevin was not really a, a guy that you had to try and figure out because it was all there in front of you. Obviously, as a fan, like I said, I started supporting Newcastle in about 1995 and I've got a bunch of memorable games. I might have been young, but there's a lot of... I went to a lot of games with my dad and I, I'm fascinated by the entertainers era, so I re-watch a lot of games. And I have a lot of memorable games. I think one of my memorable games is actually your debut game, which was the 3-0 win against Coventry and then also another game, uh, the five, obviously the 5-0 win against Manchester United. So what was your most memorable game and why? Um, all of them, I loved, you know, I was lucky enough to play 220 times for them. So I, I loved every minute of it. But the first game was a special game because there was so much excitement and not, not necessarily hype, just a, a frenzy of excitement. You know, the warming up beforehand. I've never seen it before. The whole stadium was wearing black and white. It seemed that everyone was wearing a black and white shirt. It was insane that it, whether it was a family, that every kid, they had black and white shirts on. So when we was warming up, me and Les, again, we said, I said, all I can see is black, black and white shirts. So if I miss past the ball, that's probably white because it was the whole stadium was was black and white. And the roar when you go down the steps and come up um, was something that we we'll never forget. Uh, and obviously it went really well. We won and led scored and we hit the ground running. So that was a memorable game. There was another game. The five nil will always be memorable. You know the Philip Albert chip. Um, although I was I didn't play too much of it. I come on the last 10, 15 minutes, whatever it was. But still. Beating them 5 0 was always a little bit, give us a little bit of pride back. But it didn't rectify that we, you know, we, we blew the league and, you know, they go credit to them, but they won it and we, we should have won the league, not for us, but for the fans and, and for the club. But there was a game that we played Nottingham Forest and it was actually the Kenny Dalgleish era where we'd had a really tough year that Kevin, Kevin Keegan had left, Kenny had took over. But if we'd won the game pretty well, well, I mean, two or three goals. We end up being in the Champions League and we're playing Nottingham Forest and we end up winning 5-0. I you know, had a good game, Leicester scored again, we win 5-0. So we're in the Champions League and then we it slowly trickles down in the stadium that Middlesbrough got relegated that season and Sunderland. So the place erupted. Not only are we in the Champions League and we're playing the likes of Barcelona and uh, PSV, but now our big rivals, which I love the North East and the area, and, but they'd gone down. And it was such a, a euphoria, although it's great for the city and great for the region for them to be in it. At that time, there was a lot, and it still is with me and them, and they don't like us and we don't like And that's fine. That's that's how it is. And that's how it should be. Uh, so that was a memorable game. The Barcelona game in the Champions League to beat the likes of Barcelona 3-2, Tino getting a hat-trick with his header uh, and, and penalty and playing against like a Figo. And not just having your first Champions League game against you know, no disrespect, Olympiacos or Porto. It was against Barcelona. Barcelona. You know, and, so, and you're playing against Luis Enrique and Rivaldo and these players. And for the hour and two minutes, we were sensational, you know, for 62 minutes. And then they started getting on the ball. Um, so they're the games that really stick out for me. Uh, the Barcelona won the first game, the 5-0 uh, against Nottingham Forest. But I can honestly say, and Ian Russ said it to me, I know he was only there a short time, he said, Towards the end of my time, I got to 32, 33, and obviously things were starting to, to change with Sir Bobby Robson. But he just said, have a look where you are sometimes, you know. And that final couple of seasons, I look around at St. James's and, you know, realise where we are. Another one that comes to mind, Sir Bobby Robson's first game. You know, Rude had gone. Uh, Bobby had come round and his team talk actually just before the game is to Alan on the Thursday. He's like, why do you keep showing Alan to feet? Why don't you face that way to goal? It was so simple. And he knew our names, which was great because Bobby, Bobby wasn't the best with names. Um, so he knew our names. And we went out and beat Sheffield Wednesday 8-0 and Alan got five goals. They're the type of things that you reminisce. And it was a big turning point for the club and we started going forward. But um, yeah, they're the memorable ones. But the Barcelona one sticks out as, as well. But the first one, you know, you never forget your first love. So And it was such a, a special time. But uh, as I said, all I could see was black and white shirts. So that's probably why I kept giving it away all the time. There were shirts everywhere. <laughs> But it was it was fantastic. It was fantastic. And I feel like the entertainers era, obviously you're all young, vibrant, energetic, such good a looking, great ta- good looking, good looking, I would looking. say. Good, Janola was good. good, good Janola Janola. Was, was, and you know. also good good hair. You could take credit for that. Great yeah, hair. There was a lot of hair. There was a lot of hair in that a, team as well. A lot of hair. You rocked all the jerseys really well too. And I think that the way Kevin Keegan just instilled this belief in you. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. And it was just that winning mentality. But I think further than that, what do you think just made things like click so well? The way you guys gelled together on the pitch, it was just, I haven't seen anything like that in years. Yeah, I think 
Well, no, it was the fact that the players that was already there, even the likes of Scott Sellers and Mark Cottager, that was actually, you know, me and David were sort of replacing them, made us feel welcome. You know, and we'd known Steve Howie, Rob Lee, uh, John Beresford, and obviously Peter being in the England side. So we, we knew him, but didn't really know him. But they took us under our wings. Like we went out, there's a famous picture that we'd go out for something to eat in Newcastle on a Monday night. Me and Les, my wife was away. So Les said, what are you doing for food? I said, nothing. Let's just pop into town, get some pasta and go. All of a sudden, it's, it's spread like wildfire. Steve, Steve Watson has said, OK, fine. And in the end, there was about 26 of us in this restaurant having a, a few beers and a drink. It was a Monday night. We didn't have a game until the Sunday. But that togetherness, you know, Philip Albert, Mark was there. You know, all these people, Pavel Cernicek, was all there with us and made us feel welcome. And we really got on. Again, even now, you know, our good friends with Rob, Peter, Alan Shearer, God rest his soul, Gary Speed when he was here, Shay Given. You know, the list goes on and on and on. So David on social media, Shaka is over in the States as well with, with me. So we just had a lot of good rapport. And like you said, because we was young and Kevin was a big part of it because although you said it was a winning mentality, he wanted us to have fun and play. You know, sometimes no. we'd have a team talk and they'd look at the opposition. And again, no disrespect. It, the Wimbledon one comes to mind straight away. We end up winning 6-1. He looked at their team and said, I've got the one I wanted. Let's go and beat them. And that was it. <laughs> there was nothing too elaborate about what he was doing, but he wanted me and John Beresford to push forward. If Keith Gillespie and Janola was wide, we'd tuck in. If they was tucked in, we'd go wide. Peter would come short. Les would go in behind. If Peter comes short, Rob would push in. Let Lee Clark or David Batty. So it wasn't complicated but we knew what we wanted to do and I, I knew I'd have an option for Keith to Les or to Peter or to Rob Lee or to Lee you know I had options to get the ball and but we got on really really well you know and uh, our friendship and you know yeah we'd had a you know maybe one or two beers together which was part of it and part of the northeast and the culture and um, how how we was with the fans you know we would go out and the fans would be there and they loved it that we was there and being part of it. it. We was actually in the same bar or restaurant as they was. It wasn't like us over here and you're in there. We was mixing in with people and, uh, you know, we was going to a lot of sporting events to people, the charity events. So there was a real connection with the fans, the city and the players. And um, But a big part of that obviously was Kevin, but also the nucleus of the players that was already there. They There was none about them and us. We was all welcome, the four of us when we come in and the type of people we are. Um, we mixed in really well with them as well. Even Den David, you know, he's come from Paris, the language. He soon realised what a Newcastle Brownell was, so it wasn't a problem. Obviously, this isn't something I enjoy talking about, but we have to speak about it. You touched upon how this era was obviously very remarkable, but there is a bit of pain attached to the memory just because of how close you got to clenching the title. And, you know, it is a gut-wrenching memory. And me as a fan, I can feel all the sorrow in the world for it, but to speak to a player who actually had to go through that and process it is something else. So I just wanted to ask, how have you been able to process that over the years? How have those emotions changed since first happening up until now? Did it get easier to process? No, it's still devastating now. You know, when you think back and, and again, I touched on it earlier, it was never about us winning it or the group of players. It was about the fans. You know, when I see Blackburn winning the Premier League, Leicester, you know, Liverpool after third, we should have been there. We we failed. The bottom line is, you know, that whether it was the pressure, the inexperience, the changing of formation, as a group, we we wasn't maybe mentally tough enough. Great credit to Manchester United. They're ruthless, they're resilient. The, you know, the game against United at home was a big, big turning point. We were still seven, eight points ahead. Um, Canton R hits, you know, at half time, you know, we absolutely battered them in the first half. Smichael was making saves, Lesnar hit the post, they're clearing it off the line. Maybe then we spoke about and saying, look, whatever we do, we don't lose this game. Kevin said, go and show them that we're a better team. We went out, we got the sucker punch, they scored with about 12 minutes to go, and we never really got over that. And then it was like having sand in your hand. It kept up, the harder we tried, it kept on slipping away. We started to change a little bit of formation. We were just clutching at straws and we just lost momentum. And anyone can tell you in any sport, once you lose a bit of momentum, you could see we were just drifting away. And, uh, you know, as I said, they they just had that know-how how to win it. And unfortunately, we'd only had Peter that ever won a, a title. Um, mm. And I said that the mind games at King on we did speak about it. Me, Les and, and Peter was in the shower about February time and said, you know, should we maybe shut up shop a little bit? Or cut? 
And Peter said, KK won't do that. If he's going to win the league, a little bit like Pep, if he's going to win the league, he's going to win it that way. He ain't going to win it any other way. And, you know, Kenny Dalglish come the season afterwards and we was winning games 1-0 and, and the fans didn't really enjoy it. Although we was getting success and getting to cup finals and getting to Champions League, the fans wanted us to entertain and go forward and it was never going to change. If we was going to lose, which we did, it was going to be that way. And unfortunately, that's what it is. But there's not a day goes by that I don't wish we'd won the Premier League. And again, it's never for me and it's 25 years ago. So... Mm. But, and, it, and it is still hard to understand and digest, but I do understand the reasons why now. When it was happening, you know, we'd watch games and maybe because we was the entertainers, we was always playing on a Sunday night or a Monday. Man United would play on a, a Saturday against Southampton, not really in the spotlight, win the game 2-0, get out there. Now the spotlight's on us. What's going to happen with us? We're the entertainers. We've got, you know, Ginola, Ferdinand, you know, these are the players that everybody wants to see. And, you know, it does mount up the pressure um, and then you you draw a game and then it all starts happening and yeah you know would I change it maybe I would have liked to have won a game one nil or two nil against Man City or, or West Ham and, and have that winner's medal um, but Kevin was never going to change because that's how he wanted if he's going to win it he was going to win it that way um, mm. but to answer your question I don't think you know you're ever going to get over it uh, you just find a way to, to get through uh, and, and understand it. But listen, it was a wonderful time and the excitement that we had and people like, we're still talking about it now, 25 years ago. So it, it, was, a, it was a hell of a ride, as they say, but there was just something missing at the end of it. Mm. And like you said, so January 1997, King Kev, you know, he was on his way out. Kenny Dalglish came in. What were your feelings that day? What expectations did you have of Dalglish? You know, some huge changes were happening. Insane, really, because we just beat Tottenham 7-1 at home. <laughs> we just won the yeah. game and then we, we were getting ready to go to Aston Villa. And uh, we'd heard, obviously, in the summer, the, the team was, the club was going to go on the stock exchange. It was going to... But we didn't really understand how much we'd like Freddie Shepard and uh, Douglas Hall, how much it was really going to change about buying players, the money and stuff. We wasn't really involved in that. We were just playing and uh, having fun. And again, we were second in the league. We was doing well. Uh, but Kevin had found out that obviously he was going to be a bit of restriction about money, how he was going to go. And don't forget, he just spent 15 million on a world record on Alan Shearer to yeah. come in and we'd had Tino and we'd had David Batty coming in so he'd been used to trying to identify to take us to the promised land uh, and come along so it was a huge huge shock that uh, he was leaving because of the circumstances and again I would say 95% of us was all there because of Kevin you know he tapped me on the shoulder come and join a big club spoke to Les went out to David in in Paris and said to him you know this is what we want to do and sold the thing to David once we're there we know why we're there when we're playing and the, the fans and we're happy to play and then for him just to walk away and not see it through was was a big turning point was a big change for a, a lot of us because we we'd had that identity and that togetherness with him for a long long time uh, and had a lot of ups and downs Kenny Dalglish come in with the utmost respect from everybody at the club obviously what he'd done at Liverpool and Blackburn and anyone that knows Kenny, he, he loves his players. You know, he really looks after his players. He's not the best with the media or with, you know, with fans, but he wants to he wants to look after his players. And he made us, again, a little bit more defensive-minded. He made sure that we would grind out and win games 1-0, which we went to Highbury and did that and other games, and ultimately got us in there. But it was a big change in the respect where, you know, David Ginola wasn't part of Kenny's plans because he wanted a, a, a winger to come back and help out. And David was David. We give him the ball and he win as a game. So, you know, that's... And not saying that David wouldn't work back, but it, that's not his forte. That's not what he's good. And it's the same with Tino. You know, when we play Tino at home, he's magnificent. Sometimes away from home, he, he goes missing. And that's that's how you find out about players. And we, we understood that. But Kenny wanted a more disciplined team, a more team that was pragmatic. I mean, you know, again, I, it's quite common knowledge, but I was good friends with Les. We was away on a holiday in Bali and... Kenny had said to him, you're not going to play every game. He just scored 50 goals in two years. And to turn, and he got PFA player of the year. Mm -hmm. Turn around to him and say, you're not going to play every game. And Les was like, what do you mean I'm not going to play every game? I've just scored 50 goals, player of the year. He brought in John Dale Thomason and said, look, you know, we're going to change a little bit. And then that upset Les. And Les has come out, and I think you've, you've got it on your interview, that it's probably the biggest mistake he'd made. He wanted to stay at the club and be there. And maybe give it another year. And if it didn't work, then... Because I said to Les, we're sitting 
I said, how on earth is he not going to play you with 36,000 fans and another 10,000 outside? They've ripped his head off. They've, you've got to be playing. You're, you're Celez. You're, you're a big part of this team. You're a superstar at this team. Mm. But it didn't. It materialised. And then it started to crack. And then David left. Shaka was going. And then, it, as I said, it, it was a, a knock on the Fed. But, you know, we did qualify for the Champions League. We did go into two cup finals. You know, we was successful. But there was a, there was a, a something had to give, and it was a style of football that give. And some of the players that had left, obviously, were were big fans' favourite. And we never really, as I said, Les Ferdinand leaves. Alan Shearer breaks his ankle in a pre-season game. It's Tino and John Dale Thomas, and John Dale Thomas against Sheffield Wednesday, first home game of the season, gets through one on one, misses the target. Going back to what I said, he never got over that pressure. Although mm. he goes to win a Champions League, it just suffocated him. And for that year, it was hard for him as a young player coming over uh, to the Premier League. And then he left. He went back to Holland, gets successful, goes to AC Milan and wins it. But at that time at Newcastle with the pressure and how it is, it takes special players. You know, we brought Gary Speed in and he could handle it. You know, Shea Given could handle Shea it. Given. Uh, was, was excellent. So there was a big turning point in the culture. But Kenny was great for the players, but there was a lot of changing of the style of football uh, and, and things going forward. But, you know, that's part of being professional athletes. You have to adapt. And uh, and we did some of us, you know, some of us left uh, and some of us obviously stayed for the club. Hmm. And then let's fast forward. So two years later, so then it would have been September 1999 when the club appointed Sir Bobby Robson. And I guess you could say after Rude Hullet, he sort of brought a new lease of life. Like he knew what Newcastle was all about through and through and by now the backbone of the squad were nearing their mid-30s and I guess it was a transition period how do you think Sir Bobby Robson sort of dealt with that? He was magnificent he's he, you know I love uh, Kevin and Kenny Dalgleish rude was rude and you know football wise was good but his, his man management skills was poor you know leaving out Alan Shearer in a in a, a northeast derby you just don't do it and then call mm. it a regional game it's not a derby Going back, and you said it, he didn't understand the club. He didn't understand the region and the people. He just thought it was just another club, and it's not. And, that, and that's ultimately why he failed, uh, because he didn't understand the importance of what the football club means to the people. But Bobby come in, and as I said, he just said to Alan, face the goal. He got what he called the blue chip players, which was myself, Rob Lee, uh, Gary Speed, Shea Given, and Nikos Dabizaz at the time. And then he sprinkled it with the likes of Kieran Dyer, Craig Bellamy, Lauren Rebeur started coming in, Jermaine Genus coming in, you know, uh, Aaron Hughes started coming into the team uh, and he did it in a way and we all served our, our purpose and you said I was getting to my mid-30s and he said to me, you know, I'd been his captain uh, when Alan was injured and you know, a big part of the, the blue chip players, as he said, for them uh, three to four years. But he was ruthless, Bobby. He, he knew the time. He had a similar instinct to what Sir Alex has got when to get rid of you at the right time. You know, we'd, going into the uh, 2003 season, I was, again, being captain, being playing. Aaron Hughes had been doing well. And we was going to a bit more younger, dynamic, quicker players. And Bobby said to me, look, you know, I was in the last year of my contract. You can stay and we'll give you another year, but I want you to start working in the academy. I said, you know, Bobby, I, I'm going to be retired a long time. I don't want to be retired now. I want to I want to keep playing. I feel like I can, can play. He said, no problem, son. Whatever we can do, we'll, we'll help you. A couple of weeks later, I get my move to Derby. And at the time, it was like, you know, I could still play. Now, you've asked me that question, what's it like 10 years, 20 years later? He was absolutely right. It was the right thing for the club to do. Although I didn't want to do it, I was mm. man enough to accept it and think, you know what, I'll go and play for another good football club, Derby. Um my time at Newcastle had served the purpose to let the young players understand what it's like to play for the club, to have the experience. They go on to the Champions League, they go and beat Inter Milan, they go and have great games against Feyenoord. And he he knew that better than anybody else. And that's why he sorely missed. For me, he's the best manager we've ever had because of what he had to work with at the time and the way he did it and transformed it. The way they treated him was disgraceful because he was a legend. And not only that, he loved the club. He loved being around players. And I've learned a lot of things in my life. You learn it from your, your dad or your brother or whoever. But the way he conducted himself as a person with the fans. We'd be at Sellerhurst Park trying to get an aeroplane to come back to the North East. He'd be talking to a steward or a fan for 45 minutes about the game. About wow. what happened in Italia 90 when he was there. And we'd go, you know, gaffer boss, we've got to go. We can't, no, wait, 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 we'll get the next one. 
And that's how Bobby was. And he was just a, a true gentleman, uh, um, a fantastic manager to be around tactically, but he was even a better person. Uh, and if you get a chance, I'm sure most people have watching the documentary, he loved the game and he loved people and he loved fans and he just emulated everything that's that's gone on about the club. So he was magnificent. Even though he showed me the door, I still, I still love him and respect him because it was the right thing to do for Newcastle Football Club. Wow. And yeah, I mean, six and a half memorable years at the club and you represented the club through arguably its most defining era of modern football. How important is it for you to keep this bond with the city and the fans? It's a big part of my life. And as I said, it was so exciting. You know, I'd got married, I'd moved there, had kids there, played, you know, arguably some of my best football there. Um, you know, just a special, special time, you know, particularly in this moment with the pandemic, we've had enough time to self-reflect and look at where we are and where we're going. Um, but one thing I know, I can, my, I can put my head on the pillar, is that I appreciated every single time I was at Newcastle. And I love going back. It's moved, it's different, the club, uh, people, but we have that special bond. You know, you said about your dad taking you. He would think about that time and laugh about it and smile about it because it was such a, a wonderful time. The city was vibrant. You know, the, the buildings was going along, the bars, the restaurants, the apartments. It was put on the map, the granddad collar shirts, the players that we had, you know, it was just a special, special time. And, uh, you know, something that I'm obviously very, very fond about. I look at the club now and people think about old players. You know, you hear like the likes of Roy Keane having a go at the club and this and that. Ours is not having a go at the club because we're bitter. It's the fact that we want it to do well. We want Mike mm. Ashley to put money on it because we know if he gets it right, what that place can be like, what mm. it can be, how we can go and how far it's deteriorated and gone down. You know, I hear, you know, for Newcastle from the manager, oh, if we, if we, finish mid-table successful for me there's no ambition that's not successful that's mm. not for me you look at Wolves or Leicester how can they be higher than us Southampton it, I just don't get it I just don't get it but that's me and I've, I've lived there and I've been there and I understand you know what it is I'm not Geordie you can tell by my accent but I get what the people are and I get what the club is mm, Geordie at heart for sure mm. well I've I've really appreciated the insight thanks so much Warren for speaking to me that's an absolute pleasure. It was nice to reminisce. Yeah, <laughs> take a trip down memory lane. I love a bit of Newcastle nostalgia. Guys, if you're <laughs> watching, if you want some more Newcastle nostalgia, then do subscribe to my channel. Thanks a lot for watching. And thanks again, Warren, for joining me. Bye. Bye, pleasure. <laughs>